Hello again. We are up to chapter six of our explorations in astronomy, and we're going to be looking at telescopes and other ob observing instruments. Uh, behind me right now, I have a graphic of the uh, Yerkes Observatory Telescope. Uh, the observatory is north of Chicago in Wisconsin, in uh, uh, lower state Wisconsin. Uh, it recently closed. Uh, being so close to a major, major city with lots of light pollution and being so low in elevation in the atmosphere has made it uh, very obsolete in terms of, of uh, its, its true functionality as a research institution. But uh, the telescope itself is still there and could be put back into use for some interesting things, uh, nothing that's going to be as groundbreaking as, say, the, the uh, Keck Observatory in Hawaii or the Atacama Desert Observatory is being built now, certainly nowhere close to the Hubble or anything like that going on up in space. But it still does have a potential life. It is the largest refracting telescope in the world. And we'll talk about reflecting and refracting telescopes here as we go along. And I may change the background here a little bit along the way when we get closer to some of the other telescopes that we're going to talk about. Uh, but let me try once again to share my screen. Let's see what's going on in the rest of the world here. And we can try to get our slideshow to start. Astronomical instruments. You may remember from uh, early in the semester, early being just a couple weeks ago actually, uh, when we were talking about astronomical instruments, the number one instrument is actually your brain. The number two is the eye and the number three is telescopes and other things that are part of that sort of assemblage of technology that we use. Of course the Hubble the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope, is the most famous telescope in the world now, uh, perhaps the most famous ever. This is an artist impression, although you can go to the Smithsonian Institution and see its twin. Uh, when they were manufacturing it, they made spare parts for everything, so whenever you're building one, you build more than one. And uh, the, the twin of the Hubble is actually on display in the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and you can go and see it. Uh, it has solar panels, as you see. They, they continue uh, to sort of move around, flap around as, as the Hubble orbits the Earth. The Hubble goes around about 18 times uh, a day, uh, between 16 and 18 times a day. And it will, in fact, uh, lock on to things as it goes around and it can keep a lock for quite some time and if it loses the lock it can reestablish it when it comes back around the other side of the planet. We don't just have telescopes out in space though, we also have quite a number here on Earth. A couple of things to note about this picture here, uh, this is in Hawaii which might surprise you considering this white stuff here is snow. Uh, but snow happens on the tops of mountains everywhere in the world. It doesn't matter that it's closer to the equator because the higher the elevation, the less atmosphere you have, and that tends to keep things colder, even in warmer climates generally. The lack of atmosphere is also what's good for the telescopes because you don't have nearly as much of a problem with the light making it through the atmospheric interference, and we saw that in Chapter 5. Uh, and, and another thing is notice these other white things here. These are the clouds. If you're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's how much it costs, uh, on facilities like this, you don't want it to be clouded out. And that's one of the problems we have with the Kirkwood Observatory here in Bloomington. That was a problem with the Yerkes Observatory that we have in our, our graphic here. Uh, they're so low in elevation that they can get clouded out on a regular basis. So we do have quite a number of good facilities around the world and we keep getting better and better at them. But as we look up in the sky, one of the things that we've learned, because we now know that there's more to space than what just meets the eye, uh, we see in infrared, which is what we can see over here in picture C, we can see in x-rays, which is what we see here in item B, we can see with our visible light, this would be a sort of a naked eye or, or close to it kind of shot. All three of these are of the Orion 
constellation. This is the Orion region, and this is the main region here. The three stars in the belt that are easily identified are here in the midpoint. That would be about here, and that would be about here as well. Notice that we have some different objects that don't show up very well in visual light. Notice we have really big hot spots here. Infrared shows us heat signatures for the most part. And we can see a little bit of that in the visual light here. It almost disappears in the higher range in the x-rays, but it's very, very vivid and vibrant in, in the infrared. This is an area of star formation. This is a stellar nursery. And uh, we'll see a little bit more about that later. The word telescope literally means far seeing. Uh, so you're scoping it out from a long way away. Telephoning is uh, phonics from a, or sound from a long way away. Television is watching video, watching images from far away. Teleporting is sending something far away. So, so telescope means seeing far away. And there's a sort of trick question. How far can you see with the naked eye? And I often ask this in class, and some people will say two miles, and some people will say five miles. Some people will say, well, maybe even 30, 40, 50 miles if you're looking at the mountains on the horizon. The truth is it's something of a trick question because when you're looking at something, whether or not you can see it depends upon whether or not it's in your line of sight, nothing's blocking it, but also how bright it is. You can see the moon from 250,000 miles away. You can see the sun from 93 million miles away. If the moon were 93 million miles away, it would be a lot harder to see. We can see different stars that are hundreds, even thousands of light years away. And the most distant thing that we can see with the naked eye without any telescopic kind of aid is the faint bulge of a nearby galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Remember that big spiral that's our largest spiral neighbor, but not our closest neighbor? That's actually the farthest thing we can see with the naked eye because we're actually seeing hundreds of billions of stars all at once, but from a very, very long way away. We barely see it. We've been doing things, watching the sky for thousands of years, even before we've had telescopes and before we've had reading and writing, these areas here, uh, especially Stonehenge over in England. This stonework here, which is a sort of a later development, there used to be other smaller stones and even wood uh, uh, things that were here before, predate reading and writing. Uh, Machu Picchu here is also something that is remarkable because so much of it is aligned with the sun and the stars. As we watch how we look at things in the sky, we look through our eyes. We have a lens and the lens brings the image to the focal point. Hopefully for most of us, that focal point is the retina. If it doesn't hit the retina quite directly, then we will often have glasses that will bend the light a little bit differently uh, to get it to hit, hit the retina. But that's the same uh, basis of cameras and telescopes as well. We have light coming through a lens that's being drawn down to a focal point. Refracting telescopes are very, very simple. They have a lens at the big end and a second lens at the small end, which is the eyepiece. And essentially what's happening is that light goes through and goes through uh, the, the, uh, the, the big lens here, and that is your light collector. And it ends up in your eyepiece, and the eyepiece is where you will focus things. With a reflector, the light collector is the mirror in the back here. The starlight comes through, hits the mirror, gets bounded back to a secondary mirror, and then to your eyepiece. And still here, the eyepiece is the focus. And, and uh, we, you'll have different eyepieces for the telescopes, and these eyepieces will also be your magnification. You can make things larger or smaller based on your eyepiece. So, so you'll have a main item, the mirror or the primary lens in a refractor. Uh, those will be your light collector, and then you'll have your eyepieces as the magnifier. So those are different functions in a telescope. Here is our Yerkes Observatory telescope, the one again that I have in the back of me here. Uh, notice the person standing down below here 
as, as we're looking at it. This is a 40 inch telescope. Now that looks a lot longer than 40 inches. Uh, and it is indeed, the 40 inches actually refers to the lens at the top. The lens is going to be way up here. This glass piece weighs several hundred pounds. Uh, so it's at the top up here as the whole thing swings around. This tube, if it's not structurally reinforced, can be subject to warping. It will also have off to the side here some counterweights. So as it goes around, it has to be able to swing all the way down from horizon to 90 degrees, so zero to 90, and it has to be able to swing all the way around 360 degrees. So, so this blue podium here, uh, uh, this blue mounting, I should say, uh, is, is constructed so that it won't get in the way as the telescope beams around in different ways. And there's probably just a small portion of the sky that it won't quite be able to lock in on from this side. Uh, because it won't be able to get much above there, but it could, but the telescope could go almost directly overhead. And one of the things we also have when we're dealing with this is the sky seems to rotate around us. Of course, we're the ones that are spinning, but it looks like the sky is spinning. So if it's not in range of the telescope at a particular time, you can probably wait and get it in there. So, so there are all sorts of tricks of the trade to make sure that telescopes get a maximum range. The downside is here up in uh, lower state Wisconsin is there's a large portion of the southern sky you're never going to be able to see because the earth is always going to be in the way. The closer you are to the equator, the more of the sky north and south you can see. And in fact, if you're at the equator, you can see all the way to the North Pole and all the way to the South Pole. That would be the absolute best place on the planet for a major telescope. Anywhere north of that, anywhere south of that, you're going to get the planet blocking you some of the time. But we have a solution to that. We have telescopes in Hawaii, which are not quite at the equator, but close. And then on the other side of the planet, on the south side of the planet, we have some in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, and they sort of compensate for each other. But pretty much none of those are refracting telescopes. Uh, this one is uh, uh, edging on to being 100 years old, uh, not too long from now. Uh, and uh, we're, we're not just not making those anymore because we can go much, much, much larger than 40 inches with our reflecting telescopes primarily because the weight is going to be at the bottom down here rather than at the top. So you don't have to swing it around at the, at the end of a, a 30 or 40 foot tube that's there. The largest refractors that, that, that we have uh, uh, in, in the world are only about maybe one tenth to one fifth of the size of our largest uh, reflecting telescopes. And we don't really make those in, in, anymore. The, the, the reflecting telescopes are really the design that we have. And in fact, the Hubble is, is a reflecting telescope as well. Uh, we have the light coming in. We have a Newtonian focus here where this is the curved mirror. As the light comes in because of the curvature, it will seem to miss the thing that's right in the middle there. You don't end up with something obscuring your sight. And it will bounce to this, which is just a flat mirror and into the eyepiece. Cassegrain has a curved mirror up here as your secondary mirror, which matches the curvature down here, and then your eyepiece is going to be at the bottom along the way. There are, there are slight physics reasons uh, if you're having a, a small telescope, uh, why one might be useful over the other in terms of certain different kinds of, of viewing. We won't worry too much about that. Uh, for, for our purposes. But most larger prof uh, uh, professional telescopes, as, as it mentions here, have the Cassegrain uh, focus. And my big orange telescope in my office uh, also has a Cassegrain uh, kind, of, kind of thing. This is going to be a Cassegrain here. Uh, you can see again, for size perspective, the guy down here, this is much larger than 40 inches uh, uh, along the way. This is over eight meters. So think of, of a meter as a yard. Think of a yard as 36 inches. So eight times 36, yeah, we're that, and that's just that rough, rough, rough estimate for showing you the size. But this is a huge, huge thing. Notice that we've got some kind of platform under here. 
this is going to be something that is going to be super smooth, but it's also something that can be heated and cooled because as starlight will hit it, it can warp the mirror, just as anything that heats or cools will expand and contract, uh, this will keep that from happening because when that happens, uh, it can throw off your vision here. Uh, again, large, large, large. Here we have the, the, the main mirror in, in the, the, the center here, and we have it inside a dome, and you can see the person way down at the bottom here for size perspective. Here we can see also at the Gemini eight meter telescope. Uh, we have a, a huge mirror that's there. And notice that we don't need to have a complete tube in the middle uh, because when, once you have all the light shutting off, you don't really need to worry about it uh, coming, coming in quite so much. This is part of the Keck. Uh, the Keck is 10 meters across, but it's not just one solid mirror. As you can see, we've got a hexagon kind of uh, uh, shape going on here. And for size perspective, here's one of our technicians in the middle of all of these. These are all heated and cooled as well, and they're polished to a high degree, but you can remove a segment if a segment has a problem, rather than destroying or needing to resurface the entire mirror. And notice we've got twin Keck Observatory mirrors here. This is at Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Notice that we've got two different observing positions here. And that way we can look at the same thing from slightly different angles. It's going to be ever so slight when we're, when we're dealing with this along the way. But we can also merge the data together in something that's called interferometry. And we'll talk about that much more when we talk about it with radio telescopes. Because the shorter the wave, the less that works. Remember light from Roy G. Biv, which is what this, this will be looking for, will be small enough to fit in between my fingers when they're together, whereas a radio wave could fill the entire facility. One radio wave could be longer than this. Now Mauna Kea is at the top, as I mentioned before. Uh, uh, Mauna Kea is the, the top of a mountain in Hawaii. Uh, we have the Keck over here. We have several other observatories up here. Uh, we tend to find places that are good for astronomy, and we, we keep them in, in business by replenishing, rebuilding, reconstructing, and building more things on there. This is somewhat of a controversial situation, uh, since this is also considered by some Hawaiians to be a sacred site or a holy site. And there was a controversy because the construction of things on here is not always gone according to getting permission from the native Hawaiians themselves to go forward. Uh, in, in large part, uh, the, the Hawaiians on this island and a few other places in Hawaii have been supportive of science and the endeavors of astronomy. But there are some tense points now and then. But uh, it, it's worth working with the local people it is worth respecting their wishes and respecting their needs, but it's also worth investing in that because these are great places to build telescopes. If, if it didn't matter, then we could just relocate somewhere else and say, we don't need your site. But the, but the truth is, this is one of the better sites, and it's not just sacred for the Hawaiians. It also happens to be, by nature, a place that is very, very good for observing. Now, as we build telescopes, quite frequently, bigger is better uh, because you can collect more light along the way. As you expand out the mirror, you're going to collect more and more light that's going to come in to your, your central focus along the way. And another place where we're building super large telescopes uh, with the inventive name, the Very Large Telescope, is at the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is opposite of Hawaii. Remember, we're building north of the, the equator in Hawaii. We're building south of the equator here. Again, notice we're at the tops of mountains. We are in a, a rather unvegetated spot uh, so that we're not likely to get lots of rain and lots of clouds and other kinds of things. Now, Hale is a major person, George Hale, in the construction of telescopes in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He built the Yerkes 
again, the one I'm doing here, uh, in he, when he was living in the Chicago area, and then he moved out to California and built, as you can see, 60 inch and 100 inch and 200 inch. These were then reflecting telescopes, and, and the 200 inch uh, at, at Mount Palomar was the largest and best telescope in the world for many decades. As we look through these telescopes, we can sometimes get things that are not just Roy G. Biv. Remember in chapter five, we could see that there, the atmosphere dipped down in different areas around, especially around Roy G. Biv, we get a little bit of UV and we get a little bit of infrared, but we also get some other infrared and some other uh, portions of our spectrum coming through. This is a picture of Jupiter that's coming through the very large telescope in Chile and it's getting some of the infrared. Uh, so so uh, what we're getting here is a little bit of the image that we wouldn't be able to see with our natural eyes. And what we're doing is we're looking at other wavelengths here. The best thing to do now, however, is to take a picture of something because pictures can actually register a lot more than our retinas can. And for a long, long time, we would take pictures and we would have film and we would have to develop the film and the chemical process could bring out some details, but sometimes could also change or obscure details. Today, we use charge coupled devices and almost everyone has a charge coupled device now. If you have a telephone with a camera in it, uh, then you have a charge coupled device. What these are is these are uh, sensitive uh, 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 sensitive panels where the light will hit it and the light hits it and registers what color it is. Remember the colors change, the wavelengths change. So a wa particular wavelength will hit this and it will say, oh yes, that's blue. Oh yes, that's red. But these can actually register up to billions, four billion different variations in terms of what the colors are. Uh, along the way. And we can get millions and millions of pixels. If you've had any experience with phones over the last 10 years or digital cameras over the last 20 years, you know that every other year you get something that's much better and much better and much better. And we've literally gone in my life in computers, my first computer had a green screen. And then my first computer with any colors was a Commodore 64. The next computer had 128 co colors, and then the next computer had 256 colors, and then the next two computers had 512 and 1024. Notice what's happening here? It doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles, and now we're into the billions of colors, and we're into the billions of pixels that we can, can map things onto, uh, and, and some of the best kinds of telescopes like the, the Kepler telescope that was looking for planets around other stars will have these huge matrices of charge coupled devices so that they can get very, very precise. When we're looking at different wavelengths, notice here we can see through the black, the, the black plastic bag. We can see the heat signature of his hands because the bag is probably room temperature, maybe 70 degrees. His hands are probably 98.6 degrees, more or less. I always worried about whether he has a soul because it looks like he that disappears uh, in, in this, but apparently what's happening is the, the glass in his eyeglasses are blocking the infrared rays. And that is another instructive element that we get from this. The cloth and the plastic are not good at reflecting back the, in, the infrared, whereas the glass in the glasses are. They're keeping the light, they're keeping the heat from leaving his body and they're pushing it back in. Uh, so that's an interesting thing to think about when you're sort of wondering uh, whether or not the windows should be open or closed in the summer or the winter uh, based on sunlight and, and what the sunlight does. As light comes through a, a telescope, we can actually shunt some of the light off into a prism and get our spectrum. Remember again, chapter five, when we were talking about the spectrum and we can uh, separate out the different light that we get so that we could actually look at the image in red or look at it in green or look at it in blue. We also want to get a good resolution. That means we, we want to be able to see from a distance if things are blurred together, if in fact they are separate items. If you look at Jupiter, if you go out maybe 4, maybe 5 a.m. tomorrow, 
uh, and and I think it's it's uh, 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 probably going to be cloudy, so might, might as well sleep in. But the next time Jupiter is in view uh, for you, go out and look at it with the naked eye, and you will see a bright dot. But then, if you go out and look at it, even with 10 by 50 binoculars, if you've got a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars, you've got a better telescope than Galileo started out with, you will be able to see that break into two, three, four, maybe as many as five different dots. And that's because it's far enough away and bright enough away that just using your eye with no adaptation, the light bleeds together. But you only have to magnify it just a tiny bit and get it clear enough that you'll be able to resolve the different dots that are around it along the way. So, so that's called angular resolution. We can use lenses. We can also use coatings on lenses. We can use the natural refractive properties of oils. If you ever see an oil slick, you may see a rainbow like this taking place. We can turn that to our advantage. There is, of course, an upper limit to this. We call it the diffraction limit. And you've all probably had an experience where you've taken a picture online and tried to blow it up and it turns into a bunch of pixels. And that's essentially what's happening. The, the, the photograph was taken with a charge coupled device or scanned in with a charge coupled device or by some uh, process that gives you the pixels. And when they're pushed together, then you don't see the pixelation, but as it gets larger and larger and larger, that's what happens. And we have that with the most distant things in our, our sky as well. But I like this one. Remember I told you we, we could separate things out into red and green and yellow and blue and all of these different things through the prism. Well, this shows you how that can be advantageous. If we were just looking at this middle image here, this combined image here, you might not notice much except for just a little bit of wispy green on the edge. It takes a green filter to notice that we've got that mid-range. Remember, blue is high energy, red is low energy, so green's going to be mid-range here. This mid-range light is everywhere in this photo, but it's being drowned out either by the, the high energy or the low energy. And notice there's high energy everywhere too. We wouldn't see it if we were only looking at the composite picture here because this area of low energy is in front, this low light energy is, is obscuring it. So what's happening is probably in three dimensions, we have the energy level going from the blue through the green to the red, sort of in three dimensions. Notice this black stuff in here, these sort of clouds. Those are probably areas of clumpiness that are going to begin forming stars. We don't see it too much in the red. We don't see it too much in the blue, but we see it a lot in the green. So as the energy is being pulled out, it's being pulled into, in part, these areas and being then drained off. And, it, and it's really interesting as we look at those things. This is actually an x-ray. We can't see x-rays. That's a trick question. How many of you have seen an x-ray? No, you haven't. What you've seen is the leftover of something in Roy G. Biv when x-rays have gone through it, but you haven't seen the actual x-ray. If you could see the actual x-rays, then you would have different eyes than what we see. But we can take an image of actual x-rays and then transpose it down. And so we would see, if we could see in x-rays, something like this. But if we were looking in space just with Roy G. Biv, this would be invisible to us along the way. The first radio telescopes looked like this. Notice it's on tracks. Uh, the people who saw this, Carl Jansky, we actually use his last name uh, to, to measure things in radio. If you actually watch the movie Contact, Jodie Foster, Matthew McConaughey, I've mentioned it before. Uh, they, they actually say, there, this has got a lot of Janskys uh, com coming along uh, when they get a transmission. So, so th th it's named for him. The people who saw this first thought he had invented a new way of drying clothes. You hang your clothes on the rods and you spin it around and presto, they're there. This is just basically an antenna. You've got an antenna, I've got an antenna. Uh, sometimes we don't even realize we've got them because they're hidden uh, from us because we have super sensitive antennas now. Back then, you had antennas which were basically just metal rods and he would get these uh, 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 signals that didn't match any other radio sources on the ground. Now, of course, we have these huge things like the Robert Byrd Green Bank Telescope. If you're senator, you can get things named after you too. 
but this is in the West Virginia area, the sort of northern West Virginia area, and it can swivel, swivel and pivot in a lot of different ways. This is the Atacama array. Notice we've got a bunch of different telescopes here, and it's in the southern hemisphere. This is also in the northern Chilean desert, and this is the very large array, which is in the deserts of New Mexico in the northern hemisphere. So notice that we have all of these different uh, dishes here. This is where interferometry comes into play, and I'll talk about that here in just a moment. But one of the largest radio dishes in the world is the Arecibo. If you ever watch the movie GoldenEye, uh, this one features in, in that, the James Bond film GoldenEye. Uh, it's actually an old dried up lake bed. There's actually a, 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 a drain there because when it rains, it fills in again. Again, radio waves are really, really long. So you don't have to worry about being crystal clear and smooth and polished uh, at down, down to exacting uh, measures. You can actually have Sean Bean fall off the top here and crash down on the ground uh, down there, clomp around a bit, because it's not nearly as hypersensitive as, as we, we would need for something where the rays uh, of where the waves fit right between your fingers along the way. That's actually been superseded by another larger radio telescope in China that's just gone online in the past couple of years. But radio makes it through a lot more things than Roy G. Bibb, makes it through a lot more things than a lot of different types of electromagnetic radiation. So, so we really have opened our eyes to things in the universe by looking at radio images. And some of the most distant things that we've seen are actually called radio galaxies. We have radio telescopes in a lot of different places. We have them over there in Hawaii with other complexes. This one is the Green Bank. Uh, this one down here is as the, the uh, Arecibo in Puerto Rico. This is the very large array. The Atacama one would be actually about down here off, off of our picture. But you can change these, or chain these along, chain, C-H-A-I-N, chain these along. So if they're all looking at the same thing at the same time, it simulates having a dish this large. You don't have to build one half the size of the planet. You just have to have things along the way. And you get a, a very high resolution based on that kind of thing. It's called interferometry. This picture here is, I think, one of the most astounding pictures in terms of technology, in terms of civilization on our planet, and in terms of where you want to go to get a good image of the sky. All of this light, all of this nighttime light is light pollution. We don't tend to think of it as much as we think of uh, ozone or carbon dioxide or other kinds of, of smoke and other kinds of uh, pollution, but this is pollution nonetheless. And here's the sad thing about all of this. None of this is doing anyone any good whatsoever. Nobody lives up here looking down who needs to see this. I mean, sure, it's pretty, but for every one of those light bulbs, someone's paying a light bill. For every one of those light bulbs, someone is burning fuel, usually fossil fuel, uh, to keep it lit. None of this is necessary. We live on the surface of the planet or just a, a little bit above it. If we could figure out a way of saying having a light bulb and capturing the light and beaming it back down to where we live, we could actually save the planet two thirds of its light bill every single day, every single year, every single decade, and not have the sky disappear on us. Because if you go out tonight and you're living in Bloomington or Indianapolis or any kind of city and try to see up in the sky, chances are good you're not going to see much. If you try to go out in Manhattan, in New York, or in the middle of LA, you're not going to see anything at all. You might see the moon, you might see uh, Venus, but otherwise you're probably not going to see much at all. Go out here to the west. People remark if they go out to Utah or go out to Nevada or go out to Montana sometimes. And that it's just astounding what they see in the sky. People go on cruises and they get away from the city lights and they're in awe of what they see. Notice over here, this is Hawaii. There's not a lot of light pollution there, especially on the Big Island, which is where Mauna Kea is. Notice down here, this is Chile, Northern Chile. Uh, the deserts and the mountains there, not a lot of light pollution there. 
the equator is right here. So we've got, got something a little bit higher and we've got something a little bit lower from the equator. So we can cover the entire sky from these two places. But we also have some other observatories. We have quite a number of facilities in Australia. Notice the big interior here for Australia. Not a lot of light pollution there. Uh, so, so unfortunately, notice this big patch of, of light called San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, all the way up to San, San Francisco. This is where Mount Palomar is. This is where Hale went, because when he went there, there wasn't a lot of light there. Now it's the center of Hollywood, and they're beaming light on purpose into the sky. Uh, so, so, so there are places on Earth that are worth seeing in terms of astronomy. Now, all of these lights make for lovely, lovely things. And we can tell a lot about how developed a country is. This is the United States. Notice how much more developed the East is than the West. This is that sort of empty rural area, uh, except we've got Salt Lake City here, and we've got Denver here. Uh, we've got uh, Kansas City here and St. Louis here. Uh, so we can see where the big cities are. Uh, then we've got some areas up here in Canada that have a couple of big city areas as well. We've got Winnipeg and, and Calgary uh, up there. Notice our Caribbean islands, the most lighted one is Puerto Rico. It's an American island, so it has more of an infrastructure there. Notice over here, we've got South Korea and North Korea. North Korea is this dark patch up here. South Korea is all lit up, just like Japan. We look here, this little snake kind of thing. That's the Nile River right at the border between Egypt, which is developed, and Sudan, which is not, that's where the light stops. We can tell immediately where it is. Uh, we can see Western Europe is hugely, hugely overdeveloped here. Uh, we can see Iceland, not so much. There's just a little patch there. I love to go to Iceland in part because you can see so much more in the sky when it's not cloudy. But if you ever, ever, ever see different kinds of petitions to save the night sky and get rid of light pollution, they're not trying to take lights away from you at night. They're just trying to re redirect it down to where we live and it will save money and it'll save the sky. And that is a very important thing for us for a lot of different reasons. Speaking of the sky, sometimes we have to get into the sky to see different wavelengths that don't make it all the way to the ground. So one thing NASA has done is built the SOFIA plane, which looks for infrared uh, technology or infrared uh, uh, wavelengths using technology that was developed that could sit at the back of an airplane. And of course, an airplane tends to be rather jumpy when you're uh, flying along. So this has special insulators to keep it on target as it's looking for things in space. But the Spitzer telescope came along and it, it solved a lot of problems as well because it's in orbit, it's above the atmosphere. And it doesn't get any of the atmospheric interference whatsoever. The Spitzer was sent up to last for about five years. It lasted for more than 15 years. It was just decommissioned this past February. Uh, a final project on the Spitzer telescope would be well worthwhile. I just read a book on the Spitzer two months ago, and it, it, it has such a remarkable history. And you can see the images here. The Hubble gets all the credit and all the glory. Uh, but the Spitzer is sort of its, its, its uh, 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 cousin workhorse that does just as much. Then we have the Chandra. The Chandra is named for a guy named Chandra Sikar. I got to meet him. He was an astrophysicist of huge renown, a great, great mathematician as well. This is the X-ray satellite uh, that we have because X-rays don't make it through the uh, atmosphere either. How do you catch an X-ray? Well, if you have a mirror, uh, let, let's say this thing is a mirror here, and you're trying to catch an X-ray. Well, guess what? The X-ray is just going to go straight through it. That's what X-rays do. They go through things. So what we had to do was we had to fool it, and it turns into a kind of a coil. So imagine this sort of round thing is the coil. And as the, the, the X-ray hits it, it actually bounces back and forth, back and forth, across, sort of like a stone skipping on a pond, down to the focus. That's why we have a coil of mirrors. So it just glances off and bounces down. 
Then we have the Gamma Ray, the Compton Observatory. These observatories, by the way, the Compton and the Spitzer and the Hubble and the Chandra are considered the great observatory series by NASA. This way we can get up there and we can see the gamma rays and x-rays and infrared and ultraviolet and, and uh, uh, the, the visual light. We don't really need a radio telescope in orbit the way we need these kinds of telescopes in orbit. Gamma rays, gamma rays are way at the end, hyper energetic, super energetic, very hard to focus. So basically these are tubs of goo that aim and we say, yep, they're coming from there. Nope, none over there. Yep, they're coming from there uh, uh, along the way. Here's another image. We've seen this in our last chapter. Visible light makes it all the way down to the ground. Some, just a little bit of ultraviolet, a little bit of infrared will make it through. More infrared makes it through the atmosphere to certain levels, so our SOFIA plane works. Gamma rays, x-rays, most of ultraviolet rays are blocked, so we have different types of machinery, different types of satellites that we send up above. Radio waves make it all the way down to the surface, so we can use our surface equipment down here. Of course, the Hubble is the one that everyone knows. This is the Hubble deep field. And notice what it's saying here on this slide. This is collected from September 24th, 2003 to January 16th, 2004. So it basically sat there for about four months and just looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked at the same patch. And what they did was they looked for a place in the sky that looked like it was completely empty. And then they focused on it and then they looked for a patch that was in that that looked empty and focused on it and focused on it. And what we can see is no matter how far out we go, how mad, no matter how far uh, uh, back we're looking, we still have galaxies and we still have structures and we still have stars and we still have all sorts of things as, as far back as 13 and a half billion years ago, which is when we begin to lose focus because there simply isn't anything out there to see. But again, here we have the Hubble, goes around every 90 minutes or so, every 96 minutes. Uh, so so uh, an hour and a half, remember close is good in astronomy, so, so that's what we'll do. Uh, goes around 17,000 miles an hour. Uh, it has its solar panels. This is an actual photo. This isn't just an artist rendering because the space shuttle was designed to service the Hubble. The Hubble was designed to be able to be serviced by the shuttle. We don't have that anymore, but when the Hubble was launched in 1990, it had a defect right away. We had to send the shuttle up a couple of years later uh, to fix it. But the Hubble was only supposed to last for 10 years. Remember I said it was launched in 1990. What year is it now? 2020. 30 years of the Hubble. When NASA gets it right, they get it really right. And these are some of the more remarkable images. This is from the Eagle Nebula, sometimes called the Pillar of Creation, because inside here, the light that you see coming through here, are stars that are being formed by the gas and dust. There are new stars being born. This is part of the Horsehead Nebula, which is an absorption nebula. Remember, last uh, lecture we talked about some things absorb the light and leave empty lines, some things emit the light and give us bright lines. This is an absorption area here. Uh, notice low energy, lots of red. It's also going to collapse into star formation. It's part of the Orion Nebula. Here are several different images from the Hubble, this one up here. Uh, uh, often called the butterfly. And it is a star that is exploding. And what's happening is the gases are being thrown off as it's exploding. Uh, an exploding star is called a supernova. And it's returning its materials to space and new stars will form from that. Over here we have the quintet, Stefan's quintet. And this is a group of galaxies that are all interacting with each other gravitationally. Uh, down here, we have uh, the, the uh, 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 star field, which shows a bunch of stars in a globular cluster. And a globular cluster is one of those clumps of stars that goes around our galaxy, but sort of holds itself together as almost a ball of stars. Remember, red is lower energy, blue is higher energy stars. Uh, to our, our naked eye, they would mostly appear as white light, but when we can look at them through our different lenses, our different different ways of seeing, uh, we can see the colors come out more 
dramatically. And this one here is called the Carina Nebula. And the Carina Nebula has a lot of greenish gases around it, a lot of mid-range energy gases. But we can see light coming out from inside. This again is a stellar nursery where stars are being formed along the way. And the, the replacement, you may have seen this actually in some of my backdrops uh, here for the Hubble is the James Webb Space Telescope. It is, we hope, we hope, we hope, going to be launched next year. And each one of these mirrors is larger than the mirror on the Hubble. So imagine how much strength and power we're going to have. There's another one that goes down here, uh, uh, by, by the way. So imagine the strength and power that this telescope is going to have once it's up and running. And it's going to be further out from the Earth than the Hubble. So it won't have any interference from Earth's background radiation or anything like that to interfere with it. Then this is yet another one of the Atacama Desert constructions. Uh, this one is not the very large telescope, it's the extremely large telescope. And it is under construction now, so this is an artist representation. Notice these little things down here, these little ants walking around, these are actually people. This shows you just how large that is. When you're getting to be this large with the adaptations that we can have, we can actually match what the Hubble can do in space now on the ground, but this will not come close to the James Webb. So there's quite a lot out there in terms of our astronomical instruments. There's quite a lot of stuff that's, that's uh, a possibility. I'm going to make a short video for you also showing you some of my own telescope equipment, which is nowhere near now that you've seen the James Webb and the Hubble and, and the Spitzer and the Compton and the Chandra and the extremely large telescope. I'm going to show you these things that I can hold in my hand. You're going to be like, ah, that's not quite so good. Uh, but it's the best we can do. So, so uh, uh, hopefully we can have a little bit of fun with that. But I will try to make a video of that and I will post it in the Astronomy Club. So if you want to see that video, you're going to have to join the club. And it, if you join the club, you can actually get extra credit too. So think about joining the club. There's not any extra work that's in there that won't be fun, I promise. And it won't be anything that's graded. It's all pass or fail. But you can get some points there. So please come join us over there. We've got a couple of things going right now. Uh, some videos on relativity stuff. So if you ever wanted to think about time dilation and time travel and, and how things shrink and, and expand in, in our view, uh, come look at that. Also, we have something about what to see in the sky if the clouds ever disappear. Uh, so, so please join us for the Online Astronomy Club. Remember, send me an email with your email address, and I will add you into that club. And otherwise, I will see you next week.